Thank you for, for the invitation to be here. Um, it's wonderful to see Tim. Um, we haven't seen each other in a long time, <laughs> but um, I was recalling that um, my 2007 book, Human Machine Reconfigurations, opens with um, two epigraphs from Tim's writing. So um, he's, he's the inspiration that gets that started. <laughs> um, so the way we thought we'd run this is that we'd each just do a brief introduction, maybe in terms of, of what we're doing now. Um, my work now is actually quite different from what I'm going to be focusing on in my comments, but I thought I would just mention it. Um, and so we each do a, a sort of brief updating on, on our current work. Um, and then we'll each do um, about a 10 minute kind of putting some things out on the table um, for us all to think about. Um, my comments are going to focus on design and Tim's on use um, as, as figures, I would call them. Uh, and then we'll um, see if we have things we burning things we want to say to each other, but we're also very keen to open it up um, to all of you um, sooner rather than later so we can get your questions. So just briefly, um, I have had the, actually, I think amazing good fortune to have two jobs in my life. I mean, this is just so rare in this moment. I worked for 20 years at Xerox's Palo Alto Research Center, and then I worked for 20 years at Lancaster University in the UK. And I guess I would just say that for me, the move from the corporate world to the university was what I consider to be a move into the real world. Um, that is, I would say that the corporate world is a much more self-referential encapsulated universe than the academic world, in my view. And moving into the university gave me the opportunity to really breathe, to really think about what I cared about, to become, I feel much more engaged um, with the world in the areas that I, that I cared about. So um, I have a bit of an allergy to the ivory tower premise of the academy and the real world premise of the corporation. Um, we could talk more about that, but um, uh, so uh, so, and most recently, um, uh, my, well, for, for decades, um, I have been extremely concerned about, um, I'm a U.S. citizen, I'm living now in Canada, um, British Columbia, you can see a bit of snow out my window, um, but I've been very concerned about um, U.S. militarism, and so my work now is at the conjunction of uh, critical work on U.S. militarism and critical um, but, I, but I think also, I hope, generative work in, in relation to the resurgence of artificial intelligence. Um, and so that's, that's where I'm focused today. So, Tim, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm, I'm, I think I'm at something of a turning point in my own career. I, that I, I just have the feeling that I've wrapped up the last 30 years of work. And just to explain, <laughs> uh, the, the first decade of those 30 years was the 1990s. When I was working on a whole, when I was working on a whole series of questions related to how people perceive their environment, I was looking at the anthropology of skill, at, at forms of dwelling, and so on. And all of that led up to a big collection of essays, which was published in 2000, called "The Perception of the Environment." And in, in the same year, actually, 1999, the year before, I moved from the University of Manchester, where I had been based for yonks for the previous 25 years to set up a new department of anthropology here at the University of Aberdeen. Uh, so I spent much of the 2000s, um, that first decade of the, of the new millennium, setting up the department, setting up all the programs and the rest of it. But I was also putting together a, a new book of essays, which is called Being Alive, which developed some of the implications of the view of perception that I developed in, in the earlier work, particularly the idea that, um, that every living being has to be understood as a, as a nexus in a field of relations and as a locus of, of growth and development. In, in perception, what I tried to do was to produce a synthesis of, of relational thinking in anthropology, of developmental biology, of ecological psychology and phenomenology. I was putting all those together. Um, and that led me to this idea of, of thinking of life as um, as lived along lines, along pathways, and the idea of the meshwork as this mesh of paths. 
Um, and that idea was developed along with a whole lot of new thinking about lines in, in the noughties. Um, at the same time as I was also developing a, a teaching and research program, which brought together what I call the four A's of anthropology, archaeology, art and architecture. I mean, a big thing happened in 2002 when I, I had been working on hunting and the ethnography of comparative ethnography of hunters and gatherers up until then. 2002, I said, I have had it with hunters and gatherers. I'm not going to do that anymore. So I could concentrate on, on art, uh, anthropology, art, archaeology, art and architecture. So that was the 2000s. And then, then in the last decade, partly because I got a nice big grant from the European Research Council for a project called Knowing from the Inside, um, Anthropology, Art, Architecture and Design. Uh, I've been further developing these ideas, but specifically with regard to how we can think about imagination, because I've been writing earlier about perception and people have rightly said, OK, you're telling us how you think perception works. Where do you put imagination? And I'd always been avoiding the question because I worried that if we bring imagination in, we reopen the divide between humans and non-humans that I've been trying very hard to close up. But so I spent the, the, the last decade um, working for that. And just to show off, I now have a, a third collection of essays just come out. It's called um, Imagining for Real. So now I have, um, I now have all three. Um, Show off. I just want to show off, you see, because I just got Routledge has also reissued the old one. So now I have being alive, the perception of the environment, and imagining for real. So there's my there's my 30 years of work. And these arrived, <laughs> these ones arrived in the post today. So that's yeah. why I'm feeling quite excited about it. <laughs> Get them anyway, on the Christmas list, folks. Yeah. So so um in 2018, I uh, retired just before my 70th birthday. So now I got used to working from home. And the reason why I think this, this is a sort of a turning point is that when I got all this art, anthropology, art and architecture stuff wrapped up, I want to go back to field work in Finnish Lapland that I was doing uh, in around 1980, uh, which I never wrote up properly. So I'm going to go go back to becoming an ethnographer again and back to the north, which is really where I belong. So that's me. Oh, that's wonderful. Uh, well, as you can probably see, um, I'm also emerita now and um, both Tim and I see retirement as an opportunity to really finally get to work. Um, yes, <laughs> absolutely. So, so yes. So anyway, that's, that was, that's, that's wonderful. So let me just start, um, start things off uh, here. And um, as I mentioned, I, I guess I, I saw that um, John uh, kindly put um, a link to my book, Human Machine Reconfigurations in the, in the chat. And I do like to think in terms of configurations um, and, and, and basically that means thinking about figures. And in our conversation, I think today we're gonna to be thinking about the, the figures of design or the designer and use or the user. Um, and one of the aspects of configuration, of course, is that, that the question is how are things figured and how does, how does the way that things are figured have implications for their relations? Um, for their, the con part of configuration. Um, and as we figure and refigure um, the, the, the things that are posited as the entities, you know, design, use, we're also reconfiguring um, how they are thought of in relation. And it's really gonna be that relation, I think that, that we're gonna be focusing on. Um, so I'm gonna start by talking about design. Um, and we're having our conversation today um, roughly 20 years, uh, sorry, 50 years after the first um, participatory or co-design movements. And I wanna kind of tie UX back into those. Um, and those were happening in the seventies, um, most famously perhaps in Scandinavia, but also in the UK through initiatives like the Lucas Aerospace Workers Plan in the 1970s, which you may or may not have heard about. 
Um, so the plan was developed collectively by the trade union unionists at Lucas Aerospace, and it proposed what they named human-centered technologies. That's, that's what they called them, that could be manufactured using the skills of the existing uh, Lucas workforce. Um, and this was part of what we would today call a, a just transition as we're talking about it in terms of, of energy um, from arms production uh, in that case. Um, and the Financial Times uh, in 1976 described the Lucas plan as, quote, one of the most radical alternative plans ever drawn up by workers for their company. And the plan was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize in 1979. Uh, and the lead engineer and trade unionist uh, on this was Mike Cooley, who some of you may have heard of, uh, author of a book, Architect or B who went on to realize um, these ideas in his role as a director of the Greater London Enterprise Board, um, where he helped set up worker cooperatives. Um, they, they developed a huge number of designs and prototypes for things like electric bicycles, small scale wind turbines, uh, energy conservation services, disability devices, remanufactured products, community computer networks, uh, a woman's IT cooperative, uh, and, and the designs were registered in an open access product bank. And, and a lot of this comes from a, a Guardian, a, a really lovely Guardian article uh, recent, uh, well, from a few years ago that I'll, I'll, I'll put the, the, uh, the, the link in the chat. So we, we have those things going on in the 1970s and the design world. We have um, books like um, Victor Papanek's um, 1972 design for the real world. He's calling for a radical redirection of design practice from first world consumer products to majority world sustainability. So these are pretty exciting things happening uh, 50 years ago. Um, and yet here we are half a century later and we're still hearing announcements like that of Tanya Snook um, in her Fast Company article, which, um, which John passed along to us um, this past October um, that uh, the, the title UX has a dirty secret. Uh, and the opening paragraph of the article um, sets out what she calls UX theater, um, which she says, quote, happens when designers are asked to pretend to do the work of design and aren't actually permitted to do the work of design. It happens when we're asked to conduct research that never gets used, when we deliver findings that get shelved because they don't align with executive or shareholder expectations when we're asked to facilitate workshops in which staff pretend to be users because it's cheaper and faster than doing research with actual users, or when we get to review the design when the product is about to hit the street and it's much too late for any actual design improvements. So even from my work in the very privileged site of Xerox Park, a research center, um, and, but even more from what I know of that's ha happened to friends and colleagues of mine, who, who are, are living and working in the design world. This is very familiar. So what seems blindingly obvious here, um, to me at least, is that the limiting factor is not the absence of uh, good intentions or creative practices, but rather the political economies, you know, with small p, small e, the, the political economies within which professional designers work and the kinds of relations that those arrangements allow or don't allow. Um, and the most confining design spaces, in my view, are corporate settings, which are implicitly the ones that, that Snook is writing from and about, um, and which basically ensure design's commitment to shareholder interests. Um, and to me, that this can still be framed as a dirty secret um, is symptomatic of the effectiveness with which professional designers are discouraged from questioning the conditions of their own work. So um, as Mike Cooley wrote in 1981, quote, as we design technological systems, we're in fact designing social relationships. And as we question those social relationships and attempt to design systems differently, we're then beginning to, ch to challenge in a political way, power structures in society. So, so with that as context, I just wanted to put out a few topics um, for our discussion. Um, so first, um, what I wanna call border thinking about design, design slash use. Um, and this, this is coming out of a recent paper of mine titled Border Thinking About Anthropologies Slash Designs. 
Um, and in that paper, I draw on Walter Mignolo's concept of border thinking um, and also uh, on the effects of multiplying terms. And I think in the same way we could think about the relation designers slash users. So um, with reference to the slash, and, and, and this comes from the title of Walter Mignolo's book, Local Histories Slash Global, Global Designs, um, Mignola writes, the slash that divides and unites both terms of the title is the space of border thinking. So it's that thinking about the, the co-constitution of difference and relation, that the slash that indicates these are two things, but, but that also um, conjoins them. So we, so, and, and then the multiplying of our terms, so thinking about designs, um, users, um, encourages a shift from general references to design or to use to the question of how each of those is figured and enacted in specific historical moments and specific geographical, political, economic locations. Uh, and that shift to multi the multiplicity of these, these entities um, underscores the ways in which our discussion is itself part of the becoming of the entities in question. As we talk about them, we are, this is not just a kind of academic exercise uh, in the pejorative sense of that phrase, but it has real consequences for how we imagine and enact the entities and relations in question as part of our own ongoing onto-epistemic um, practices. And for me, part of multiplying design as I said, is to get away from the universalization of design um, as a signifier for, for making most broadly construed and to think more specifically about design as a profession within particular modernist histories and politics within contemporary capitalist economic relations. So universalizing design kind of claims it as a foundational human trait um, but it also installs contemporary design professionals as the logical progression of that figure's development. Um, we were always all on the road to becoming professional designers. And I think instead we need to recover the specificities of makings, conditions and relations of which design is one, um, one manifestation. So then the second uh, issue is about located accountability, what I call located accountability in professional design. This came up in the previous session. Um, and so we can be, begin that work by considering um, how, I, as I suggested, how specific locations enable the possibility of enacting design in some ways and not others. And in a paper I wrote so many years ago called Located Accountability um, in Design, I introduced the idea of located accountability to say, look, um, designers rightly claim that they cannot control what happens um, with the things that they design. Um, but my argument in the paper is that the fact that you can't control it doesn't mean that you then have no responsibility for it. Um, while you can't control it, you can't, your responsibility is to stay in relation with it. That is, you may not be able to control it, but you can know, you can care about it, you can follow its, its travels, you can stay connected, you can recognize your ongoing implication in the way that things unfold and engage and intervene in that in whatever ways um, make, make it, it, you, it is possible to do so. And then the final thing is to, to, for us to talk about are ways of designing otherwise. And I have a bunch of examples that I was gonna bring in, um, but, I, but I, I don't wanna take the time to do that right now, but I, I'm drawing from things like uh, Anita Chan's book, Networking Peripheries, um, Lily Irani's book, uh, Chasing Innovation, Making Entrepreneurial Citizens in Modern India, Arturo Escobar's Design for the Pluriverse, wonderful work, work by um, Colombian anthropologist Tanya Perez-Bustos and her collaborators in the design department at Universidad de, de los Andes, working within the worlds of, of feminist um, textile activism. So lots of rich examples of what I would call designing otherwise. So I'll just end by saying um, that, you know, where, with whom, and for whom 
matters. Uh, we need to be able to question designs, modern colonial genealogies, um, as well as designs capture within dominant modes of, of neoliberal capitalism. And that has to be an integral and inalienable part of our own technical practice. So I'll turn it to, okay. to, over to Tim. <laughs> thank, th th thanks, Lucy. I, I was, what I thought I'd do was, would be just to talk briefly about three, or link together three key terms. Uh, and one is use, the other is experience, and the third is habit. And, and I want to start with habit. I mean, we, we, we tend to denigrate habit. We think of it as something addictive. And usually we, we, we talk about people's bad habits rather than people's good habits. But I want to introduce, reintroduce the idea of habit in a virtuous sense. But it's, it's a problematic term because people are always asking, do habits come before us or after us? Do habits make us or do we make habits? I mean, habits are things we do, and it seems like we're responsible for them. But at the, at the other hand, it seems like habits are making us do things. So where, where exactly is it? And I've found great inspiration on this issue from reading the work of John Dewey, who tells us that actually uh, habits are neither in front nor um, behind, but in the midst. Uh, what habit means is that that the a person the self dwells in its own practices and is recursively generated by them so so we're inside what we do but through what we do we are cre continually creating ourselves other people and a world and and the beauty of the concept of habit as is to think from things like will or agency or concepts like that is that it puts us right inside the action, not as initiators, but as, as doing things which fall to us to do because of where we stand socially, politically, and the rest of it, which is a, another way to say that what we do is, is, is like a task. A task is something you do because it falls to you to do it. You don't, you don't own it as such. Uh, and, and so tasks are habitual in that kind of sense. And, and Dewey um, approached this whole problem by looking particularly at the relation between two terms, namely doing and undergoing. And it's really fascinating. He said, for, and, and this, this takes me on to, um, to experience in a way, because he says in, in any ex experience, somebody does something, somebody also undergoes something. Uh, and because they undergo something, they're not quite the same afterwards as they were when they started. So what exactly is the relationship between doing and undergoing? We do something, we suffer, we undergo as we do it. What is the relation between the two? And he said that, that we, we tend to imagine that undergoing is embraced within doing. So you do this and you do that. And I do something and sure, in between the beginning and the end of doing it, uh, I start with an intention or a design and I end with a, that intention realized, things have to be undergone. But still, I, I, I work from the beginning to the end. But the point is that if, if, if undergoing was encapsulated within doing, then all of life would simply fragment into thousands and thousands of distinct episodes. So re really, it's the other way around. Really, whatever we do is, um, is caught inside a process of undergoing, which means that whatever we undergo in what we do, that undergoing then comes into whatever we do next. Uh, so, so that there, there's always an excess of undergoing overdoing. It's the way life always runs ahead of itself, which I think is what design is really about. And, 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 and because um, uh, life always exceeds, wherever you are, life always sort of falls over in front, um, undergoing always um, exceeds doing. You know, it's like when you walk, when you walk on two feet, every time you take a step, you fall forwards. And, you, and, and it's only by putting the next foot down that you stop yourself. So that you start by, by somehow uh, allowing yourself to fall, taking the risk, an existential risk, and then allowing your skills to um, kick in and, and, and pull you back. So, so I think life is lived in that kind of um, alternation between doing and, and, and undergoing. And the, the critical thing then is that, um, that, 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 that when you do something, it's not a relationship between um, a, a beginning and an end, it's rather a relationship between an end and a beginning. That is, we, we start from 
uh, we start from ends and continually launch them into new beginning. Rather than going, uh, I go from beginning to end, and then again from beginning to end, and then from beginning to end, every end is, is turned in the act of doing into a new beginning. And that is what makes possible the, the continuity of life. So, so that, for me, is, is, is the essence of, of experience. It, it, it lies in the way in which undergoing always overflows doing, that uh, life always um, runs ahead of itself, and therefore that we are continually transformed as persons in and through our own habitual acts of doing things, because we are inside um, the action. So that links habit and experience. And then there's the third term, which is which is use. And, and I really think we need, to, we need to look rather closely at, at this term, um, because ordinarily in everyday life, when we say we use something, we mean that we draw it into our customary pattern of activity, like the clothes we wear, the bike we ride, the car we drive, um, the things that are very familiar to us, the, 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 the knives and forks and utensils in our kitchen drawer. These are things we use often more or less unreflectively by, by drawing them into our custom, into our usual uh, form of behavior. That is, um, use implies a habitual pattern of activity and that virtuous sense of habit that I was just talking about. Uh, and, and that means that when you use something, in a sense, and this I'm borrowing on something written by, by Giorgio Agamben, he says that when you, when you use something, you're actually uh, putting your own existence at stake. You're, you're, you're saying, um, I, I trust this thing that I'm using. Um, I, I'll rely on it and I can take the risk of, of, of pushing out. In, into the world. I mean, that, that, that's the sense, for example, where I play the cello, and, that's a, and, and I don't say that I use it, I say I play it, but, but all the same, it's the sense of actually having something that is, is, is very personal to you, which you can then take the risk of um, pushing out into the world um, because you trust that this thing that you're used to using will, um, will come to your, your aid. Um, and therefore, I, I, um, I think that there's a very clear distinction that we have to make between use and utilization. Uh, I get, if, 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 I, if there's one thing that gets me really annoyed about a lot of academic writing, and I'm sure Lucy wouldn't be included in this, but I haven't checked her text to see, is, is people who, um, in order to sound clever, routinely use the word utilize when they mean use. Academic writing is full of it. You're utilizing everything. You think, why? Because, because utility uh, suggests just the opposite. It's, a, it's an economistic relation in which uh, whatever you're utilizing is placed as far away from you as possible. Oh, I will utilize it, hoping that I'll have absolutely no sort of visceral contact with this thing I'm utilizing or whatever the utilizing thing is, is coming into contact with. So, so utilization, unlike use, uh, utilization does not put one's existence at stake, but actually repudiates any um, effective uh, involvement in the word at all. The, the, this word utilization has a kind of triple lock, uh, util, eyes, eight, and eon. I mean, it's, it's, like, <laughs> it's like putting, putting the thing really, it's, it's like sterilizing it. And, and um, I think academics, um, love this kind of verbal sterilization because they rather think that the world is something that exists um, outside of words and, and that um, words somehow won't touch it. Uh, that's a peculiar uh, academic idea. So, so that's the way I think that, that use and habit and experience really um, tie together very tightly indeed. But um, when it comes to contemporary discourses of design, um, it seems to me, as a bit of an outsider, that that nexus seems almost alien to it. That that um, that 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 the um, that habit is is not there, experience is not there, use has become utilization or something. I'm not sure what has gone wrong, but 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 I would I would like to think 
that the aim of design is to try and reconstitute that nexus um, because it, it's only through that that we can actually um, inhabit uh, the world in a truly um, fulfilling way. So that's my my my, my comments and 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 I, maybe I could just start because I had a burning question for Lucy and maybe that will help to get get it going. But, um, and it refers to yes, I think the the, the first of your um, three questions you're talking about border thinking and the slash between yes. design and use. And I was immediately thinking, well, where is making there? Is making okay. in the slash? Or, or are we just supposing that making is somehow a part of designing? Or yeah. is designing a part of making? Or are they not separate at all? Yeah. Where are we supposed to put making in yeah. the design slash use thing? Well, that's a really wonderful question. Um, uh, I mean, the slash, I was thinking about this very much at the end of your comments, because for me, um, the slash is precisely about holding in kind of abeyance or, or recognizing that, that we are in the midst of both making a difference when we talk about design and use. And, but, by the, but what the slash is trying to do is to, to question that difference, to, to recognize that we, we have constituted different entities here, but to also remember that they are inseparable, right? And that each is folded into the other. And so, and I, and I think for me, um, what professional design has done is to enact that difference mm -hmm. as a separation so that professional designers must deliver um, to users their experience, right? Um, I mean, it is, it is the, the claim of the professional designer to have a privileged role um, in, in making. And, and I take making, I would take design to be a broader category than professional design. And I would take making to be the broader category um, within which they have both been differentiated, right? So, so that's why I want to kind of, you know, make the different making differences and 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 constituting relations are always simultaneous <laughs> practices. Um, both really important, but all, always also having to be done um, together. And thinking about why are we making this difference now? Um, who who's for whom is that? Does that difference matter in in what ways and so forth? And so, so I think part of the problem that that we that we have as um, you know for, for students who are entering into worlds of professional design, for people like myself who have participated in those worlds, is to see what what relations are possible in the places that we work, mm. and. Um, the reason I sort of brought us back to these, you know, 50 years ago um, movements towards co-design was that they were very much about trying to, um, to put the particular knowledges of professional design in relate, not, not in as handing, you know, as making something for, or, or creating something uh, and handing it off to somebody else, but as part of a conjoined project of, of uh, multiple um, forms of, of knowledge and expertise. Um, and, uh, and that, in my experience, is, and I think this is what the Dirty Secrets um, mm. uh, piece is about, that, in my experience, is systematically discouraged. Um, so, you know, when I was at, at Xerox, um, the only people who were supposed to talk to customers were salespeople, marketing people. You didn't want like engineers talking to customers. God only knows what they're going to say or designers or so, um, <laughs> you know, so these, 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 these worlds have been very deliberately separated. And, and that is the, the struggle I think that many people are engaged in is to try to, to rejoin those worlds. And, and what you're pointing to, Tim, I think is, is the, also the, the, the relocating the recognition 
of those worlds within these these processes that we are all always mm. Um, mm. part of, um, of 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 making of endings and beginnings and. Um, yeah, because yeah. I, I don't have any experience in the corporate world. And and and, and so um, I'm coming at it not from that background. Sure, at all, it, but, exactly. But, but thinking more in terms of, well, what, what, what could designing possibly be uh, or what could making possibly be or what might it be from what we read from ethnography all around the place? Exactly. Uh, and, and, and one of the things that often strikes me there is that, is that if, if designing is about um, creating a future for others to use, then what is there for these others to do? I mean, it, 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 it's, it's a bit like ruining. It, it, it is actually what's happening today. And I think worries in terms of the relationship between generations, you know, that designers are designing a future that the next generation is supposed to be, to accept, to, to say, okay, you, you know, this is the future. Now you've got to live this and be smart. And, and that actually denies the possibility for the next generation actually to create a future that they can really call their own. And, 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 and I think this is a, it, it makes the whole thing rather unsustainable. Yeah. To my, my and I think there is some resistance to that that's beginning to appear. I hope so. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I, oh, I was just wondering, I mean, this could be another question too, because you know more about it than I do, is, is to what extent is this resistant there in the corporate world? I mean, I, I, I'm not ah. sure because the designers oh. I talk to tend to be a bit, bit um, radical and revolutionary, and, uh, and and not the ones in the, oh, yeah. in the suits. No, no, I would not locate the resistance in the corporate world. I, I think the resistance is coming from. Um, I was trying to think of this wonderful. There, there, it, there's an increasing sort of interest in um, moving from the idea of you know product life cycles to the idea of circularity. And, um, and, and there's a very wonderful paper about this, which, which I, I will find, but I don't have at the top of my head, um, which kind of rethinks the whole sort of product life cycle, um, you know, uh, from, from extraction to disposal um, as, as a kind of flow, a kind of movement. And, and if you if you think of yourself as a designer as inhabiting that that cycle, then that puts you in a very different place than if you think of yourself as as a designer as making things that then you know go out into the world and get sold and somebody else has to worry about their disposal. Um, so I think that's one really and and there is a huge movement around repair. Even Apple, I gather, has recently been forced to open up their the iPhone to make it repairable because there's been so much pressure against you know planned obsolescence. So repair and maintenance is kind of integral um, and celebrated aspects of so these are all parts of sustainability discussions and so forth. Um, and and then I think you know there's we see increasingly um, many, many different kinds of maker spaces um, community-based um, design um, sites, co-ops, collectives, so forth, um, all of which are attempts to set up sites for design practice that are outside of um, the, the, the corporate startup consultancy um, world. Um, but, you know, and, and I don't mean to be completely dismissive of, of the worlds that, you know, that, that you that you as students or, you know, are very rightfully going to be looking for jobs in. But I think it's really important to let yourselves really reflect on the constraints. And, and, and I think this whole course appears to be encouraging that to really look at the conditions that your own the conditions of possibility that your that your working arrangements um, provide you, and push against those, push to to try to change those and expand them and so forth. So Can maybe we should on, and we better better get some questions in. Yes, yes, that's what I was thinking. Yeah. Uh, thank, thanks, thanks so much. Um, there's, there's there's so much in there. 
I could, uh, you know, almost want to write everything down. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hand over to Al um, to moderate some questions. There are, there are a few in there. I've, I've posted loads, but it's a bit unfair of me to, to, to monopolize. Um, so uh, I'll take a back seat if there are any others. Um, <clears throat> well, at the moment, actually, I've selected one of yours um, because I think it asks, a, uh, uh, you know, a, a pertinent question, given where we're at in the conversation. So where does material sit? Um, Tim, in the, in, the, in the use, habit, experience, nexus? Mm. Um, it's, it, well, well, it's there and in, in, in the sense that um, there wouldn't be any of this stuff um, without materials. And, 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 and I mean ma materials rather than materiality. I don't like the concept of materiality. I think it's too, too general and too abstract. Um, materials are particular kinds of stuff which which have their own proclivities, their own ways of wanting to do things. Um, you know, the different materials behave in different ways under different conditions, and anybody who's going to use them uh, successfully has to have a like 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 a craftsperson has a has a very almost intuitive understanding of of the ways in which uh, materials behave. I think. Uh, the way I imagine it is, is, and this I've been thinking about imagination, is that is that human human life is caught in a tension, kind of a tension, a stretch between an imagination that always wants to shoot off in the distance, is racing ahead of itself. Uh, so we worry all the time about losing things, um, like like you know we we had an idea and it's rushed off and we can't catch it. So we're all the time trying to catch. These ideas that are rushing off ahead, but at the same time, we are uh, we have to engage with with the world of materials, which involves uh, load, involves friction. It slows us down. Uh, I mean, any artist knows about that. That their ideas are racing ahead, but there's only so uh, it's only so fast that they can get stuff down in whatever medium uh, that, that 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 they're working in, and and we're caught in that tension in between. So, so they're materials that, that embody the, the, the friction of the world and an imagination that is always racing off ahead. And, and that's, that's where the materials um, come in, um, which isn't to say that I love all this new materialism. I think some of it is gobbledygook, but, um, but I do think materials matter. Yeah, I mean, just just briefly on that, just briefly on that. Um, to me, uh, the I, I share. My, I also have problems with new materialism, but my problems are that I think um, if we look at um, the idea of of within science and technology studies, particularly the ideas like material semiotic, um, the argument is precisely that matter and meaning are inseparable and you know, there, there's um, the idea that anything is, is immaterial um, or that, there, that anything is material that doesn't, um, in its relations with us, um, acquire significant or hold significance. Uh, so everything is always already in those relations of, of matter and meaning. Um, and so it's, a, it's precisely sort of, holding those together in whatever ways, whatever, in whatever thinking we're doing um, about the world that, that, that to me is what matters. I, I don't know, I've, I got to, wrong to add, add one more thing, very, very quickly. Um, the, the, the word material used to, was applied originally to wood and it was applied to wood by Roman carpenters who adopted the term mater, which of course means mother. And what they were referring to was the way in which uh, Wood, when it grows, particularly with the branches, grow from within the body of the wood itself. Uh, uh, and, and, and that, I think, involves a, a very general principle. I, I've called it, it's what Karen Barag calls it, cutting together apart. I call it interstitial differentiation, meaning that, that material is always growing and differentiating itself, but from the inside of the process of its becoming. And that this is really crucial to, the, to, to, to understanding um, material. Anyway, that's a, the side. Thank you. Um, Lucy, I'm wondering if, if um, is there a relationship between figures, configurations and correspondences, or perhaps to both? 
Um, well, that's a very broad, general question. <laughs> so can I, I, I'm not sure I can answer it in general, um, but, uh, you know, um, it cutting, cutting together apart is very relevant here. I mean, that's part of what the slash and border thinking is doing, that all entities are constituted through, are, are, an act, are, are constituted through acts of delineation. Um, and those delineations make a cut. They, they, they make a cut and they constitute things as different. Um, and, and we always have to know when, how, through what practices, through what processes that, that's done, uh, by whom, um, in order to, to, to be able to talk about, um, about how it matters. Um, for me, figures is, is very helpful um, because it kind of, um, it, it's, for me, it, it is material semiotic. So it, it's both referring to the, the cultural imaginaries our sort of collective imaginaries, conceptualizations and the materializations of those things and how they're then brought into relationship. I mean, correspondences, I guess I think of more in a kind of representationalist sort of frame. So you have, you know, the word and it corresponds to its referent. And that of course is something that, that, that um, the, the idea of um, more non-representational ways of understanding meaning and matter and words and, and the world are trying to get away from that sort of um, representationalist, you know. I, I've word, been using correspondence in, in a different sense, meaning uh -huh. the way, way things go along together and respond to one another as they go, which is what it really means. Exactly. Like when you write letters to one another, you, yeah, so, you have a correspondence. And it's and a, a co-respondence. Yes, not, yeah, not, you're not, absolutely not, right, Tim. These words have been, these words have been yeah. so, so <laughs> bastardized. I, 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 I very much like the idea of, 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 of correspondence as uh, going along together and yes. responding to each other as you go. Yes. Uh, yes. And and that's also a splitting apart at the same time, and I prefer it. It's doing the same work as Barad's interaction, but I much prefer it to interaction. I don't like Karen Barad's notion of interaction at all. I think it's a silly concept. And 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 although we're trying to do the same thing with it, the, the reason is this: that the interaction is like the reverse of intra. In, intra sorry, interaction is like the kind of reverse of interaction. Instead of instead of going back and forth between two independent exits, it's going in and out uh, inside. Uh, mm -hmm. Whereas what I want to do is to go longitudinal. Um, instead of going back and forth or in and out, I want to go along, alongside, going along together. So it involves from interaction to correspondence. It's not a one hundred and eighty degree shift. It's a hundred. It's a ninety degree shift, like moving from crossing the bridge from one bank of the river to the other to going along. With the water that's flowing underneath, and that—that's what—that's um, <laughs> what. I, or you imagine two two friends walking down the street together. They're having a conversation. Their face—they're not looking at one another directly, but they're—they're they're talking and maybe tilting their heads a little towards one another. They're sharing the same view ahead. They're corresponding. If they suddenly turn around and face one another and start having an argument, then they're then they're interacting, and that—that's the. That, it, so it's this sense of actually. Um, Going along to yes, going along together and responding to one another as 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 um, lines in in counterpoint in 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 uh, choral music, uh, for example. That that's what, and and for me that this this particular idea has, has turned out to be rather rather crucial. It reminds me a bit of um, Paul Klee and uh, to, you know taking a line for a walk. Absolutely. And I, I wonder if, in fact, it, it strikes me that we're talking very in about the same thing the configuration of relations in in various ways and the task of design and designers to configure those relations in consciously ref, in a consciously reflective manner so as to understand how they constitute themselves in their practices um uh, uh, what lucy i think was saying earlier about um the political nature of the design studio and how things come about or how those relations come to be configured in a particular way that they do that, Absolutely, that, yeah. that then that then might 
make the lines along which we are able to um, go along together or go within. Exactly. And, and thinking about who you're going along together with is so, is so important. And it's, it's so consequential for what it's possible to think, to, to make. Um, and that to me is one of the big problems um, in the current arrangements of, of professional design. Who are you allowed to go along with in, in your work? Um, and who are you, you know, who do you consistently find yourself in the room with? <laughs> who are your clients? Where are your accountabilities? Um, what possibilities do you have? Because, you know, networks are, are crucial here. And, you know, if, if you aren't in a, in a position that, that sort of encourages and facilitates the extension of, of your relations um, into new networks, then you're always, it's very, very self-referential. And, um, and, and that self-referentiality is one of the things that I found most stifling <laughs> about, about, you know, sort of living in, in, in design worlds. Um, that, that's one of our big risks in the university as well, I think. That, that sure. We, that of we, course. We become quite self-referential. Of and, course, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> Unless it's a really devoted, you know, um, part of your of your own practice. That's you're absolutely right. And maybe that's partly why these 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 moments when we when we when we get access to to the type of thinking that you've you've talked us through um, over the last hour are so important. It came up in the previous conversation that we're in the studio and in the university, we're so busy all the time. We have briefs and we have to do work and evaluations and assessments and planned timetables. And if you like the rubric of, of learning about creativity and how to do it, that these moments of perhaps just being able to listen for an hour, that's just a great privilege. I recommend retirement. It's the, it's, it's the best research leave ever. I mean, it's, 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 uh, it's fully funded, open-ended, and has no reporting requirements. Yes, although our universities are currently out on strike precisely because they're trying to not <laughs> support <laughs> retirement. So jo join the pickets <laughs> if you ever want to retire. <laughs> I love the idea of retirement as being when the real work starts, though. That's it is. Great. I'm, 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 finding it, I'm finding this retirement business is ex extremely hard work. I'm working harder than ever. Well, th thank, thank you both so much. That's, that's been kind of the richest hour of conversation I've had this year, I think. Um, uh, that you very generous of you to give, to give so, so willingly of your time and, and, and knowledge. Wonderful. Okay, thank you for the invitation. It's been a pleasure. And Lovely to see you, Tim. Have a great, have a great evening, okay. morning, afternoon, wherever you are. Bye. Bye.